The message you're about to listen to is a message from Apostle Eric Nyamiche, the chairman of the Church of Pentecost. Apostle Eric Nyamiche preaches the gospel in its simplest form to help the believers walk in Christ and also how the believer relate with his world. This year, the message is on unleashing the church to possess nation. Join us and let's learn from Apostle Eric Nyamiche and be a blessing to the world. If you are new to this page, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on that notification bell so that when new videos are uploaded, you can have access to it. Make sure you go to our own page and check out for more videos. Thank you. The topic that I have been given to talk about is our well today, spheres to take. Our well today, spheres to take. So in summary, um, we are looking at a culture modulated and characterized by artificial intelligence, social media, climate change, war, migration, pandemics, human sexuality challenges, diseases, new medicines, race, uh, race issues, phenomenal growth of Islam and other faiths. And we are thinking of what new streams of ministry, these cha ministry challenges and opportunities are being generated with all these things that are happening in our world today and how may the gospel be relevant to these emerging situations they are already phenomenal strategies that we are using in mission and raking in great harvest but with the constantly changing world in which we live as new trends come up what new methods are we looking at to be able to meet those challenges and so that is what we are going to discuss in the few minutes that are ahead of us and i think that in a conference like this we come to have great experiences and go through great learning and um, i want to just recap a few salient points i have picked so far which is going to be a, a bedrock of what i'm going to talk about in the opening, our dear chairman said that we must contextualize the scriptures for today using contemporary language and examples. And then he also said that if God chooses you, he will not allow you to fail. How many of us heard that statement? Uh, if God chooses you, he will not allow you to fail. So as a church, we need to be encouraged to move on. Let us try all our ideas. Let us venture into unfamiliar territory, knowing that God has our back. And he is going to give us security of all forms. Spiritual, biopsychosocial. Hallelujah. He would secure us. So let us move on with all the new things and the new interventions that are coming on board. And then Apostle Dr. Deborah also cautioned us that in our attempt to contextualize, let us guard the doctrines of our faith. Very, very important point. And then Apostle Dr. Emil Jimmy Markin reminded us that the cogent factor that will make all our strategy work is when the Holy Spirit breathes into them. That the promise of the Spirit is the game changer. Hallelujah. And yesterday, my director, the IMD, made a powerful statement that you cannot move the hand of a holy God if you are not holy. Hallelujah. And this morning, our dear GS, in his last statement, said that let us experience now what will eventually occur in heaven. Now, I've streamed these things together because it's going to be the bedrock of what I am going to share. Our overarching theme, ladies and gentlemen, has been possessing the nations. Possessing the nations. Oh, possessing the nations. Are uh, my East African brothers here? Kumiliki Mataifa. Mimi ni wakala wa mabadiliko. Kumiliki Mataifa. Kubadilisha ulimuengu wangu. Hallelujah. That is some Swahili for you. I've fallen in love with this statement by our chairman. That in the coming years, the Church of Pentecost will strive to become 
a church whose members go to possess or take their nations by influencing every worldview, thoughts, and behavior with kingdom principles, values, and lifestyle, thereby turning many people to Christ. Hallelujah. Now, our dear father talks about influencing worldview, influencing thoughts, influencing behavior. So he is talking about culture creation, using the principles, values, and lifestyle of the kingdom. And culture creation is very, very important if we are going to have a sustained um, transformation. And I believe with all my heart that using the Pentecostal ethic of holiness, godliness, mission-mindedness, radical giving, power demonstration, all to the glory of God, we are able to do this task. Pentecostal spirituality can be a matrix that holds our world that is often plagued with confusion and instability, hold it together. That is when the spirit comes, that is our believers, Pentecostals, that when the spirit comes, human beings, human gadgets, human strategies, and everything upon which the spirit falls can become powerful and can be used by the Almighty God to influence our world. And wh where the need arises, when what we are looking for doesn't exist, our, our Pentecostal spirituality tells us that that same spirit that dwells in us is able to create new things. Hallelujah. And open new doors and bring new paradigms of understanding and practice. I want us to read two scriptures. Remember, I am speaking on our world today. Spheres to take. I'll read from Daniel chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, and then I'll read Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. The rest I'll pick them later. Daniel chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. Then the king ordered Aspenas, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family, and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. This Nebuchadnezzar man, <laughs> he's something else. Look at the standards he set for enlisting his army, which he is going to unleash. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. I want you to take note of the language and literature of the Babylonians. Now Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14 says that, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Now let me comment on this Habakkuk text first. If you look at the book of Habakkuk, this text looks like a misplaced text. The pretext, the post-text, and the context is all not so exciting. You see a background of chaos, a background of failure, a background of mess, but in the midst of pathetic situations, God releases a prophetic word for the last days. That in the midst of all the negativity, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord just as the waters cover the sea. I have been young and I'm still growing. I've always looked at the sea full of water. And so I know that greater days are still ahead of us. Hallelujah. If what God said will come to pass, then we look forward to greater days of God's glory, God's power, in our world. Hallelujah. Now let's come to the Daniel text. The language they were to be taught was the Akkadian language. They were used to the Hebrew. And they were supposed to relearn a new language. And then the literature of the Babylonians, my dear friends, was all around philosophy of astrology, soothsaying, omen studies. When a, a, a white bird flies from left to right, what does it mean? When a black cat crosses your path, alone, tedin, crosses your path, 
What does it mean? These were the things that they were teaching them. They were learning um, dream interpretation, prognostication of future events. How will the future look like? Now, it also included studies in purification and sacrifices. And with various kinds of incantations, they attempted to bring about the avoidance of evil and the accomplishment of good. So this was the school they were attending. So that they will become what they call wise men. People who can predict the future. People who could know when bad things are coming and would be able to do some rituals to avert it and people who could interpret dreams these were the philosophies that were being pushed down their throat but before these young men went into those classes the spirit of the holy god was already in them and because the spirit of the holy god was in them god gave them grace to be 10 times better than their peers they taught their class though they were learning stuff they did not depend on the spirituality of babylon they depended on the God whom they knew. And at the end of the day, whenever any difficult situation came, after they graduated, they were the last resort. They became the specialists. They became the consultants. They were the final uh, um, um, points. When all the other people tried and they could not, Daniel and his friends were there to show the way. And they made God popular in Babylon. When you read Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 3, and Daniel chapter 4, in many places, the kings testified that no one should joke with the God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They made God popular in Babylon. So, the, um, possessing the nation's agenda, ladies and gentlemen, is for us to study this world, study the things in the world, every field of your calling, business, commerce, um, governance, media, academia, arts and entertainment, religion, family life, wherever you are found, you can become a luminary. Who do not use, who does not use sinful and shameful ways, but who, filled with the Holy Spirit, would come up as a light bearer and one who shows the way. That is the world in which we have found ourselves. And I want to say, that God has made all the resources available for us to master this world and show the way so that the glory of the Lord would indeed fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. Transforming my world calls for cultural transformation. And the culture that we seek to transform is also undergoing a fast pace of change. And so we have to understand what is going on. And everything we've been told in this conference is that God is in it. God is in it. He has his hand on everything that is happening. And so we as a church must not shy away, must not um, 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 stay back, but be able to keep the pace. Hallelujah. We don't have to let possessing the nations become just a confessional thing. But it must lead us to change the culture around us. Culture can be created. Culture is not something that happens to us. Culture is something that we create. And so we can create positive culture. We can bring the Christ culture to bear on every field that God has called us. If we make it just a confessional thing, when all the adrenaline comes down, we can just revert back to factory settings. But we don't want to revert back to factory settings. We want to change the factory and its settings. Hallelujah. We want to change how things are done. So come with me into the discussion of God and global trends. Beloved in Christ, our God is not a cake or anti-development. Some people think that, you know, this Christianity thing, uh, it won't survive um, some level of human development. There are people who predicted that uh, Christianity would, would, would go extinct with the passing of time. But rather, it is getting better and better. Oh, hallelujah. Our God is not a cake. He is the one who is the alpha and the omega. He was in the beginning and the end that we have not yet got to. He is already there waiting for us. Hallelujah. Science and spirituality are not mutually exclusive. However, due to gaps in our interpre interpretive capabilities in the face of changing human culture, sometimes we are not able to explain 
what the scripture is saying in the context of real human or existential issues that emerge and so some people withdraw their trust from the scriptures thinking that it no longer applies to us i want you to take note of this interpretive challenge because i'll make a suggestion when i am going i'm getting to the end but i want to state that god is abreast with human development for adam god created a garden for him at the end of time god knowing very well where we've gotten to is not creating a garden for us in revelation 21 and 22 god is creating a garden city hallelujah he's creating a garden city where he's taking us to is not a garden of eden but is the new city of god a garden city and i see the theme of development in god's um, agenda and what god is doing he will introduce us into um, our i mean the eschaton and we'll realize that oh so all these things that were coming were just to prepare us so that we don't go to heaven and get lost the technology in heaven will be phenomenal hallelujah a young science student says i don't believe the bible why because the bible has a lot of errors scientific blunders and i said which of them his reply was in joshua chapter 10 the bible says that joshua prayed that god let the sun stand still and the bible writes that and the sun stood still and this young man says that according to the science he has learned the sun is already standing the sun does not move it is the earth that moves around the sun and so didn't god know this that the sun does not move joshua prayed the wrong prayer god should have corrected him maybe he should have prayed let the earth stand still because it is the earth that moves around the sun the sun has always been stationary anyway for your information there is no galaxy that is static the milky way galaxy itself is flying at a crazy speed of about 9.1 million miles per hour so the whole milky way and all other galaxies are moving flying very fast but the relative positions in relation to the earth the sun is fixed and is the earth that moves around and yet the bible says god performed a miracle and let the sun stand still and because of this little thing a young person is withdrawing his faith from the bible and there are many 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 of such examples around where people get confused as to whether god really has his signs uh, up to date but i think that god contextualizes he works with the signs of the day what the people of the day believes or no he goes with it but he knows far better let me give you another example when i was a young student when i was in the secondary school pre-internet times and if i say pre-internet i'm talking about ghana pre-internet because some people had the internet before others those times early 90s i read revelation 11 and the bible says two witnesses will be killed and their bodies will be put on the street of jerusalem and the whole world will see them and i said lies another lie because i was doing my calculations and doing all the critical how can two people be killed and put on the streets of jerusalem and the whole world will see them geographically it's not possible chronologically it's not possible we all can go there even if we all go and we queue to look at them it will take many 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 months for everybody to have a turn and they were going to be looked at for three days and the spirit of the lord will come into them again and they will rise i underlined that part of the bible and said this one <laughs> john <laughs> uh, should check his prophetic again and then the internet came facebook came um whatsapp came instagram came and all of a sudden it is possible hallelujah beloved in christ artificial intelligence social media and all these are prophetic they are prophetic god has always known that they will come 
And in fact, the prophets prophesied with these things in mind. And when that time comes, you see the fulfillment of all what God has been planning all these years. So God is in it. Beloved in Christ, God is in it. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Jesus of yesterday is the same today. He will be forever. He only changes to meet the exigencies of the time. I pray that if there are any persons within the church of Pentecost, whether in our local churches or whatever, who are still looking at the Okwinda Danumu, I pray that the Lord will help us to understand that God himself is moving towards the eschaton, where technology is part of what will make life in the end times possible. Hallelujah. So that we can move along. During the COVID-19 era, churches that adapted to systems for meetings, welfare, offerings, have become stronger in the post-COVID era, whilst those who resisted it and who did not um, um, adjust, have lost members, have become financially weak. God contextualizes. I found out that when Jonah was swallowed by the fish, it wasn't a punishment. It was actually a mission support from heaven. God was supporting him so that they would accept him. The reason being that the people of Nineveh, they worshipped the fish god, Dagon, and the fish goddess, Nanshi. When they see fish, they see divinity. So when they saw a fish bringing a man, smelling fishy, for them, he was smelling divine. He was smelling divine. God was only helping him. No wonder they accepted his message. They knew that God had come to visit them. Beloved in Christ, this is the God we serve. His wisdom is beyond human understanding. And so the tools that he gives us to meet this world, if we reject them and want to use Okwanda Danumu, we ourselves will become late. May the Lord help us to be able to smell 21st century. To be able to come into what God is doing now. Now quickly let's look at a spectra of realities in our world today. Artificial intelligence, which is intelligence of machines and um, software programs, are being deployed in many fields today, in agriculture, in aviation, in research, but don't use it to write your exams. Those students who are using uh, chat GPT to write your exams, you will be found out. It's being deployed in, in different fields of human endeavor. So you ask yourself, why not the church? The church must master artificial intelligence and use them properly. Let us use these apps well. As I said, they are prophetic. They are part of God's plan. Let's understand them and let us deploy them appropriately. Jesus went to the Sea of Galilee and sat in the boat of Peter and Andrew to preach. Now, the Galilean lake was one of the places where people converged. That is why he went there. Today, he will spend very little time at the Sea of Galilee. Even if he goes there, he will go with the camera crew. And the small time he spends there, he will share those videos on YouTube and he will share it on Facebook. And Jesus, among his disciples, he would have um, a media director who is managing his account, account manager. Jesus would use these things because he wanted to reach people. And so if you are a missionary today, jump into your boat. Your boat are these tools that God has given us to reach people. May the Lord help us to understand what the Lord is doing in our time. I don't want to bore you with the uses of artificial intelligence and um, social media. It's like singing to the choir. All of us here know what is happening. But some critics have already started disturbing the system with erroneous doctrine around artificial intelligence. Come with me to 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. Let me show you something. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. The old man John was talking about Antichrist, 
who have gone into the world. You know, and yes, so he says that first John chapter two, verse nineteen. They went out from us. Okay, let me start from dear children. This is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going shows that they are none, that none of them belong to us. People have cooked up theories that this was referring to uh, robotic engineering and um, artificial intelligence. That these are people, things we have created, they went out of us, but they are not part of us. These are the Antichrist. That is not what the Bible says. Hallelujah. And so let's learn about these things and deploy them properly. On the, fourth, on the 10th of April, 2024, Pastor Isaac Andor put something on his page which I want to quickly read. He says that the opportunities presented by AI for the church are vast. AI can help streamline administrative tasks, improve communication and engagement with congregants, and enhance the effectiveness of evangelistic efforts. Through AI power tools, the church can reach new audiences, foster deeper connections, with existing members and adapt to the evolving needs of society in the digital age. However, along with these opportunities come challenges and potential threats. Ethical concerns surrounding data privacy algorithm bias. And sometimes you type a word like hot. If you type hot, what will come is not a hot cup of tea, but something else. Uh -huh and the dehumanization of interpersonal interactions must be carefully addressed. Moreover, there is a risk of AI technology being misused or manipulated for malicious purposes, posing threats to the integrity of Christian values and beliefs. I thought that this is very profound. It summarizes some strengths and some challenges that we can look at together as a church. And so as a church, we should always be mindful that machines cannot solve all our problems. We should still complement AI with human wisdom. For example, after we have sent bulk messages and it's gone, let's still have an eye and an ear to know members who have special needs and pay special attention to them. When we lose all ourselves to machines, a lot of things to, there, there will be a lot of gaps also in the system. And I believe that as a church, it will be important to unleash a band of Christocentric technocrats into the research arena to develop more usage of AI towards more humanization and improve services without the exploitative bit. What I want to suggest is that as part of culture creation, um, and I know that already there are some thoughts uh, along this line, let us encourage our young men and women who are in this area Mark Zuckerberg and all these other people, they started small. Nobody knew they would be this big. And I pray that in the next phase, the tech giants of the next generation and the apps that will be globally popular will be a product of Church of Pentecost technical teams. Oh, praise the Lord. And let us continue to use all these machines to the glory of God. It is helping us with our offerings. It's helping us with live streaming, visualization. I mean, digitalization has, has changed the world. And let us move in that sphere. As for the challenges, they are there. Pornography and its allied iniquities, um, cyber security issues, digital distractions, and all these things are there. But I believe that we can work through the challenges when we weigh the opportunities and we buy into them. One of the things which the e-church coordinator, uh, as, um, the associate pastor shared, very profound, is in the area of reaching other faiths. Today as we speak, there are 1.1 billion Hindus in the world, 500 million Buddhists, and 24.1% uh, of the world population are Muslims. We can develop strategies, well thought through strategies that launch out 
you know, were targeted at specific um, uh, geographical locations and then um, engaging people virtually with very little risk to human life and also reduced cost. These things are things that need um, proper, you know, sitting down and really working through them. After we have prayed and prayed, we have to really set, set people down to work through some of these mission strategies to reach people who hitherto we would not have reached. During our dear Pastor Ango's presentation, a lady shared her story of how she connected to the church. So we know that today people hardly ask other people questions. They want to go and ask Google. They will ask Siri. Huh. They, they, when, they, when they are looking for directions or they are looking for things, they pick their phones and they think they can find everything there. And so, beloved in Christ, I think that if, if we are churches and we don't pay attention to our online presence very well, it is going to affect us greatly. I want to quickly touch on climate change and then bring some three interventions and then wrap up. There are some books that I wanted to recommend to you. You can uh, show that slide and then those who are interested can look at them. One by Pastor No, one by Apostle Vincent Ananidente, and then another one on cultural intelligence by David Livermo. These are resources that can help you. Now, climate change. According to the 2015 Stockholm Resilience Center research, Climate change is one of the nine indicators for measuring integrity of the ecosystem. Summarily, it's been found out that things like climate change, which is the long-term shifts in temperature and weather patterns, biodiversity and species extinction, some of the species God created have died off because of human activity and because the world is becoming more and more non-habitable. And then, um, tree, I mean, deforestation, and many, many other things that human beings are doing to this beautiful world. It's making human life here on earth more difficult. It's been found out that human action has, is destroying this world. And I believe that human action can also help to restore some of the things that we have shifted out of gear. There's a scripture that keeps me thinking. The Bible says in Genesis 8.22, God said, As long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. We are coming to a time where because of um, climatic shifts and global warming and disruption of weather patterns, it's becoming very difficult to decipher between seed time and harvest time. Things are mixing up. And when things like this are happening, it tells us that our clock is ticking to the very end. Meanwhile, God is not through with this earth yet. You see, this earth is a very beautiful planet. If you are someone who studies galaxies, you see that this earth is a very beautiful planet. And the master himself has chosen this earth as the destination for the millennial rule. This is where he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years together with us. Hallelujah. And he knows we are here. Just as people have developed technologies that are solving or closing some of the gaps, God expects us to take care of this world. That is the first command he gave to the human being, that we should take care of this earth. We should um, tame the earth, we should keep the earth, and we should, we, we, we should nurture it. And so please, if you are here and you are a Christian, this also offers us another window of ministry where we have to think of strategies to make our world a better place. We could pray that Jesus should come. But even when he comes and we go, we shall come back for the millennium. And that is why we have to be focused at helping as a church. Maybe we can focus on renewable energy, promoting the discussions, and also... Um, taking the lead to use some of the renewable energy in our temples and in our mission houses. Maybe we have to build advocacy groups that would be part of the discussion at high levels so that issues about climate change will be taken seriously by the world. Now, 
Um, dear Chairman, I want to suggest three things we can do to help us to take the spheres. There are many of the spheres we cannot talk about in this presentation. But I believe that the first thing that must be of great importance to us is that as agents of transformation, as saviors who are being unleashed to take over the mountains of the world, we have to seek personal transformation always. Always. Christ-centered and Christ-empowered lives are in short supply. Although we have many techno sapiens buzzing all over the place with fantastic and phenomenal knowledge and gadgets. But the Christ factor, the Christ factor is very important. Programs in themselves don't disciple. Structures and apps don't disciple. Only disciples disciple. And so we have to become disciples, good ones, so that we can do the work of discipling the nations. And so number one, be a true disciple of Christ. Number two, be a God chaser. That one will make you not lose your identity as a Christian. Let your greatest hunger be God. When you wake up, realize that all your springs are in him. Without him, you are finished. That is the mentality we must have. Without him, we are finished. So that our hunger for him can never be abated. Let's chase God. And then let us be full of the Holy Spirit so that we can demonstrate the power of God. As for Paul, he says he doesn't want people's faith to be based on human wisdom, but in God and his power. Power must flow from your social media handles. Power must flow from your Facebook page. Power must flow from the books that you write. Power must flow from your online engagements to work miracles, to bring healings, and to show people the way to Christ. To Christ. Hallelujah. Now the second thing I want to humbly suggest our dear chairman is that during the chairman's um, opening address, he stressed the need for contextualization of the scriptures for today. Beloved Chair, many of the challenges to faith among emerging generations today is as a result of unexplained texts or concepts of the Bible within contemporary understandings and set tensions seem to make the Bible look irrelevant to some and they don't find it applicable to their situation, especially in the fields of engineering, medicine, law, technology, and things like that. And so, I want to humbly propose, if the Church of Pentecost could consider producing a critical Pentecostal Bible commentary for the third millennium, drawing from original languages using Pentecostal scientific and contemporary tools, ethical tools, I believe that it will serve a generation for many, many years. And I believe that we have the um, capacity to be able to do that. I'm not talking about a devotional commentary, a critical commentary from original languages that infuse our Pentecostal spirituality and our paradigms of understanding into the scripture, relating it to the various fields of endeavor so that this becomes an interdisciplinary engagement. And then finally, let us deploy Christian apologetics. Let us deploy Christian apologetics to help us to solve many of the emerging challenges around sexuality, around faith, and all the other things around technology and its challenges and all the things that we are dealing with. And under apologetics, I'll just simplify it into three points. Number one, have content. If you want to do Christian apologetics and polemics, have content. Steady well. 1 Timothy 2.15. Steady well. Make sure you, you have a grasp of what you are going to talk about or the field you want to engage. Number two, show gentleness and respect. Be ethical. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And then number three, stay prayerful. It is that force which pushes your voice and ideas. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 to 5, that the weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And we, 
will be ready to punish every act of disobedience when our obedience is complete. With these three, I believe we can do great Christian apologetics. And so in these last days, as I wrap up, we can reach people in thousands and millions through internet if we have a Holy Spirit contained strategy. We can do interfaith missions strategically with minimal risk of losing human life through the internet and social media. We can reverse the climate imbalances and deforestation by taking bold steps in supporting renewable energy use, tree planting, advocacy, and general environmental care. We can resist LGBT through prayer, through proactive legislation, through advocacy, and through our strategic influence. During the last um, council meeting, um, Reverend Aflu from the um, LM churches told us that influence is a gift, and I picked that. We can take over the world of films and cartoons to make them biblically aligned, Holy Ghost inspired, and missional. We can generate a stronger tornado in the music, arts, sports, and entertainment industry and also make it intergenerational. Let us put our children in our class. Let our class not only be for the teens and the adults. Let us put our children in the choir and let them start developing their gifts right from infancy because it takes time to raise a star. I think our dear sister, beloved sister Diana, would explain that better to you. We can have excellent e-churches. We can develop ministries around mental health and allied challenges. We can save many frustrated and desperate people from messing up their lives if we have a redemptive agenda. And all the other things that by the grace of God, he's using the church to do. Finally, we can influence biblical studies and the dominant theological ideas flowing in the system by setting a framework linked to contemporary knowledge and expectations. Beloved in Christ, let us be unleashed into the various fears that God is calling us in this time. This is our time. And let us take the tools and reach out to a generation for Christ. Mungu awabariki nini nyote. Amen.